thing in natural pantheism. So, but the difference is reality in nature is concrete. We can all point to it and measure it and observe it, whereas God is imaginary. So that's the difference. Yeah, how? Why are you saying yeah. God is imaginary and reality is concrete? What do you mean by reality? Because look, there there's a million different gods throughout history. Um, everybody. Yeah, that's, that's not an argument. It's a concept. It's imagination. It's a category of imagination. No, how, you're saying it's an imagination, and I assume what you're saying by imagination is saying it's not real. So no. how are you determining no. it's no, not no, real? No, 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 no. no. We're talking about epistemology, not ontology. Epistemically, yeah. it's imaginary until you can start pointing to it as a concrete existence, like a tree or a building or something like that is concrete. No, but what you're doing is you're saying something is concrete and therefore giving it a particular type of ontology and mm -hmm. separating that from an imagination by saying that because you experience it. The concrete is the starting point. No, no, the starting point is your experience. That's what you're saying to me. Right. I take that back. So I experience that's the first that's the first level of my epistemology is that I'm experiencing exi an existence. Right. So to argue to the contrary would be absurd. So that's where I start. So that gives me the justification to infer. So if I'm going to infer things, I'm going to infer what I can observe and uh and, ex and within my experience that I understand is true, that I understand I do experience. Now, this is justification. Again, this is an ontology. So I can infer that I experience cause and effect, and I'm justified to do that. Wouldn't you agree? No, I don't you think you have. Justified. I don't think there is a justification. How do, you, how do you argue for God if you can't infer causality? How so is God I, 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 don't think, I don't think you can infer causa materialistic causation from empiricism. I think what you do is you look at correlation and the, the mind then creates the idea of causation between the two. So we're... Are you saying it's justified, though? What do you mean justified? Yeah, you're, if, you, if you infer causation and you... and you, Do you subscribe to... Obviously, you, you believe in logic. You understand... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe in logic. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> logic is based on cause and effect. Right. No, no, no. I think it's the opposite. I think logic and philosophy comes before experience. So we order our experience based upon logic. So how do you demonstrate that? Uh, so, for example, let's take uh, if I put heat under water and then I notice that the water boils. Yeah. So what am I going to say about that? What can I conclude if I put heat under water? If you and put, the water then boils. Yeah, then you, you see that the heat caused the water to boil. Okay, so that cause, that, that aspect of causation, is that something that you experience or is that something that you used as an axiom by which you then interpret your experience? I, you presume causation as a way to then interpret the correlation. Yeah, it's called inference. You inferred that that was the causation. No, inference here, but is the inference built upon the experience or yes. is the inference built upon an axiom of rational thinking? That Stop over-speaking me. Stop over-talking me. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, yeah. In my view, I think that we learn about causation through experience. You know, as a child, you know, you eventually learn you don't crawl over the couch and just fall off the couch. You'll see kids take their time to crawl down the couch because they understand about dropping to hurt themselves. So they've got to learn, you know, yeah. just like touching, putting your hand on a hot oven. You know, sometimes kids do things and they learn. I mean, you, the same thing with other forms, languages of logic, like mathematics. We have mathematic classes, you yeah. know, that don't come out. But what I'm saying is this. Do you have to learn all this. Stuff. So have you come across David Hume's argument? on uh, his skepticism towards causation? Long time ago, yeah. Okay. I know that. So, so, and this is the same argument that Bertrand Russell also adopts. Mm -hmm. um, so basically what, what he was saying is that as an individual, if your first experience of a particular event, uh, let's say, for example, on a pool table, 
you hit the white ball and the white ball's traveling towards the black ball and that's your first experience of uh, that observation what can you say about what's going to happen as the white ball travels towards the black ball well again it's it's based on on learning you 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 know you learn about how cause and effect works in different scenarios no no you can't say anything isn't it you can't in, in that first experience you cannot say anything oh, right, right, about right. what will happen towards that that black ball yeah it okay. could shatter it could bounce off it could right. move yeah, all of these know, different things you know, could pass straight through what thought it caught, was caused to do yeah, What's I agree with grief that that it's a that causation is a presupposition. Yeah, it's an axiom, and it's a logical axiom that we use yeah. in mm -hmm. the same way we use uh, locality. You know, you were talking about quantum uh, locality before. Yeah, uh, uh, same thing we use is uh, locality. So we say that a cause. So if we see two, two, two events that correlate to each other, and one is prior to the other event, then we would say that the 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 event that was closely proximity proximally uh, related to the effect yeah would be uh, or the event that's closely proximity proximulated yeah close to the the <laughs> other event would be its cause yeah yeah the so collapse the, would, the collapse of a wave function would cause the evolution of the wave function right well, yeah, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about on a macro level and a quantum level. It's it's different. It's different, yeah. The, yeah. the way we understand causality is totally different. And yeah. Not so if right. if I throw a stone at a window, and the window shatters, then the assumption would be that the stone caused the shattering of the window. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but so, uh, Sharif, can I jump in here because, like. I'm not sure if that's the argument. A guy's talking about logic, reason, and rationality. It's like uh, it's an experience. You don't presuppose. Is that what you guys talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm saying no. Logic comes prior to. It comes before experience. It's a way to understand experience. That's no. why it's first philosophy. Yeah, it's a it's a first that's prior. Kind thing. of a weird thing. So I would say, in a way, I understand what you mean, and I might even agree with you because. Just looking at it even in a, in a different way, but I, I wouldn't want to bring that whole topic up. But um, no, I would say that I would say that you, 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 have, to, you have, have to experience something like like I was telling Justin the other day. Logic, rationality, reason for me, I experience it, so I say they do it. They, they exist. I don't need to prove anything to a to a hundred percent certainty or absolute certainty to know something. And so I use the I use the in philosophy what they call thalamism. Like if I drop a rock in the water, the water's going to ripple. Okay. Logically, that's what's going to happen. If I drop two objects in on top of a building, logically, this is going to happen. Okay. So basically, when you learn about logic, when you learn about logical process or rational process, now I'm saying that, okay, now they, they exist. They're no longer presupposition. The experience are there. I've experienced them. And then it we is can still, it's this still, happened. no, no, it's so still a presupposition. They, they exist. So, and I don't need to, to, to show a hundred percent. Uh, something to, to, to happen for me to believe in it. And so it so let's, let's what, say, for example, it depends on what example. logic you're using. Are you framing yeah. it within classic logic or fuzzy logic or quantum I'm, logic? I'm, or I'm classic. Logic? Which logic are we? It, it, it really, you, know, you presuppose depending on what how you frame it. So, for example, let me give you an example, Ron. If I was to take the second stone and drop it in water, what would I expect? It, for it to ripple. Okay, so that is an assumption now, isn't it? Because no, what you're assuming... It, no, what, it, it, this is what I'm saying to you. This is what I'm saying to you. And I had to touch with Rachman, and he never understood it. And he kept repeating the same thing. I'm not assuming it anymore. I'm taking the first proposition of the laws of cause and effect are real. Yeah. Taking, even if I can't observe the actual cause, I'm saying they're real. I'm saying logic, rationality, and reason exist. And I'm saying I believe it because I experience it. No, no, but this is a point that David Hume was explaining. David Hume, the 18th Even century David philosopher. Hume, I'm just yeah, giving his explanation. You can disagree afterwards, but let me just I heard it. It. Oh, yes. So what he was saying is that the assumption that you're making is that future observations will follow past experience, but there's nothing necessary in a logical sense to connect the cause to the effect on a materialistic uh basis there's nothing necessary to say that heat will cause water to boil 
Yes, and I understand what Yubes is saying. I'm taking the position that it will. And I, I take the position that if, 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 like, just say that I boil water at 100 degrees, and some, for some reason the water doesn't boil, there will be an explanation for why the water doesn't boil. Ah. There might be salt in it. Yeah, there will be, won't yeah. they? Yeah, okay. yeah there, there will be. Agreed. There will be an explanation. But that's yes. the point. The, we no, just the point assumed is, I'm not, no, that there's an explanation. I'm not assuming. <laughs> I, I don't like it when you guys put words in my mouth. I'm not assuming everything. I'm telling you there's going to be an explanation. That's what I'm saying. I'm not I assuming think, it. No, I'm but, saying there is. But that, that's the point, though. When you say there has to be an explanation. I'm saying there is going to be. Yeah, but when you say there is going to be an explanation, is that prior to the experiment and observation, or is it posterior to it? Okay, if the I'm water did not boil at 100 I'm gonna degrees Celsius. You, I'm going to explain to you very easily, right? I'm gonna the say altitude it, of boiling water depends on the altitude. It's like yeah, that's degrees. one of them. Yeah, that's one of the conditions. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you something to be very simple. Just say I boil a pot of water right yeah. in my house, okay, and it boils at 100 degrees Celsius, right? Right. And then somebody else gives me another pot of water, and it do, it boils at 95 degrees Celsius or burns at 110. I'm yeah. going to say that when you when you do a test. You're going to find out the reason why it didn't boil it there. There's going to be a reason. There's, that's right. There is going to be a reason, and that's the point. Yes. That's what I'm saying, is that you're doing the experiment because you know there must be a reason as to why you have a different observation from the first observation. Yes. That's, that, that comes prior to your experiment. Um, yeah, because it's, it's things change. I don't know. Yes, it is because I'm going to explain why. Because I don't know what the other person gave me, right? Because if I'm given water, I'm going to say this is going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. I don't know what the second one. I don't know why the other one didn't burn at a, at 100 degrees Celsius. I'm saying there's a reason they gave me salt water. Or they, <coughs> why they should there be a reason? Hey, eh? why should there be a reason? Because it didn't boil at 100 degrees Celsius. So what? Why? Hey. Eh? So what? So what? He didn't boil it on your reason. Celsius. Why does there still have to be a reason? Because because I'm I'm following the laws of cause and effect. Okay? Right. Which so I you're don't assuming it. No, that's I, my I, point. Oh my god! When you keep saying that, this is why sometimes I don't like talking to you guys. I do not assume the laws of cause and effect. I'm telling you, there it, it's going to happen. I'm not assuming it's a soft thing. I am. How do? You, why are you saying it's going to happen? Without, the, saying, just, without just because saying I experienced it. Fact, because you experienced it, one event. And yeah. now you've experienced a second event, and yeah. you're saying that there must be a change in variable to explain why the second event does not resemble the first I'm event. Saying there, I'm saying there is going to be a, a, a change. There is so, going to be something. But there why, is. though? Why do we have to ex accept that the second event, if it's differed from the first <laughs> event, is I because just, of a change of variable? Because I'm saying, by my experience, okay, which could be a fallacy. I'm not saying it's not a fallacy. Right, okay, but I'm, I'm not saying it's not a fallacy. I'm not saying there's anything. I take the position <laughs> and experience logic, rationality, and reason, so they exist. So if you want to call it a fallacy, I'm all right with that because it doesn't matter what position I take. If I take no, a I'm not quite position, fallacy. I can't justify it. No, I'm, I'm taking the position that I'm taking the position that that's the way the world works, and it's going. It's always going to work that way. Yeah, but that's. <laughs> do you not see when you say that's how they it's always now? going to work? <laughs> that is what the assumption is. <laughs> I'm not the, assuming the, it. The presupposition, assuming. the presupposition of causation, Kirk. It's it's yeah. the idea of reductionism that local events can be all uh, specific observations okay. can be generalized sure, yes. to the whole can system. Ask question, can I, can I ask question, what is your definition of assumption? And if I assume something. The assumption is that you accept it prior to your experience. You take it as axiomatic. Okay, because maybe we have the wrong definition. I'm saying that, like, I'm saying when I drop a rock in the water, it's going to ripple. I'm not. I'm not even denying that it would ever not do it. It's yes, going based, to happen. Based on previous experiences, you have seen the rock ripple the water. But to say that it will in fact happen in the future is axiomatic. Yeah. No, it, okay. What I'm saying, Justin, is that okay. I'm going to use this as an example. Okay, if I if if I'm blind, okay, and somebody says if you take this experiment, you will have vision. I'm going to presuppose after the experiment that I'm going to have a vision. I'm going to assume my vision is going to come back. But when I have the vision, there's no longer assumption. Is no longer a presupposition. My vision is there. I can see now. 
It's no longer yeah. a position. That's my vision. But there's this a second logic, a, rationality, reason. The same thing. It's no longer. A, it's no, longer no, no. But position. there's a second it, it, assumption. It's but there. There's a, but there's a second assumption now. The second assumption is that when I do a second event, that the second event will resemble the first event. No, I'm not making an assumption about that. I'm saying it's it, it, it's there. It's going to happen. I'm not assuming. Ron, that. Ron, if you if you got up tomorrow and went out to a lake and dropped a rock in the water, yeah, would the water in fact ripple? Yes. <laughs> you just assumed it. You got it Justin, we got to hop out for a second. We got some serious lag going on. See, okay. Yeah. Justin, did I misunderstand you? Say that again. No, no, no. I, I, I was I was just asking you if tomorrow if you went and got a rock and dropped it in the lake, if yeah. right now you are saying that in fact when it happens, it will ripple. YouTube's on. Yeah, What's that? Sorry, Ron? It's, it's cause and effect. Yeah, yeah so that's the point. My, my point that's what up. that's what Sharif is saying is the presupposition or the assumption that a future event will act like a past event. Yeah, but this is my problem with presupposition. A presupposition is there's no justification. You presuppose the laws of logic, and you're saying, okay, I'm having an argument because I presuppose the laws of logic. I'm using an assumption. I'm saying I'm assuming something because I think I have it because I'm not trying to justify it. I'm saying that I have it. That's going to happen. I'm not presupposing or assuming it. I'm saying. Is there? I experience it, and I don't have to presuppose it anymore. You can't, actually, you can't justify that future events will follow past. You're talking about you can't justify that. Yeah, he's not listening to what I'm saying. He's like he's keep going on the same part, and I keep telling him there. I'm <laughs> just going. I, I I agree. Well, I I wish that I could find a way to ar articulate this differently, but I, I agree. I talked to two philosophers already about this. Okay. One was T Jump, and the other one I can't remember his name. T Jump's not okay. a philosopher. No, T Jump. Look, let's be honest. Uh, T Jump is a YouTube uh, debater uh, who's not uh, philosophically uh, trained. The other one, was, the other one was, uh, the other one was as as Ozzy or whatever his name is, and they both said a presupposition is something you you assume tactically before before you get to an argument, right? Like if you're like, it's a presupposition of, of God exists, right? They presuppose God exists. But if you know God exists, if you are 100% sure God exists, it's no longer a presupposition. Right. No longer an no. assumption. And I'm saying the same thing. I'm not assuming logic, rationality, and reason. I'm saying that I have it, it exists. Now I could be wrong, and I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm saying I've experienced those things, so I have it. There's no justification. Other reason. Yeah, justification. So what justification do you have that you believe that logic exists? It's by I just told you because of experiences. Okay, and what does the experiences tell you about logic? Does it tell you that future events will have to follow past experience? Does that is that what logic tell us, tells us tells that's what, what experience tells us about logic? What I'm telling, I'm talking about logic is that when I explain logic, is I've experienced logic, I've experienced rationality and reason. It's a process, and 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 it's and it's pretty, it's it's very consistent where it always You're is. Building the track record. Yes, it is. It's consistent. So I'm saying this is going to happen. I'm not assuming it because when you're saying about past events. You learn from past events, okay? From past events, when I was young, I probably threw a rock in the water. I'm going, oh, this ripple. Yeah. If I threw another one, I'm going like, oh, this ripple again because I went by what it did in the past. Now I'm saying I don't, I know, I no longer need to throw rocks in the in the lake because it's going to ripple every time. It's no longer presupposition. This is going oh, to hold happen. On, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. But, but what if I went to go drop a rock in the water and a fish actually came out of the water and ate the rock, like? Before it even touched the water, you're <laughs> just gonna go up and find it. You're like, nope. it didn't ripple. What the fuck? Logic doesn't work. It, yeah, because you're right. Because the logical explanation is that something caused a rock not to hit the water that didn't ripple. That's but the let me ask you a question. The next time that you drop a rock into the water, are you gonna expect a fish to come up and eat it? No. No. <laughs> right. Okay. So there's a few things here. And maybe that's how you fish, guys. <laughs> 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 worm and fish. Like, Ron, 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 maybe there's a bit of a difference between how we understand this. Did I break, did I break, did I break, I break it? I broke it. Yeah. I, think, I think maybe there might be an impasse between the way we understand it or where we're going to be able to come together on this particular <laughs> point. But generally, What's up, whether it's David Hume, Bertrand Russell, or Karl Popper, or any other uh, philosophers, they talk about this problem of one, induction, and two, the oh. assumptions uh, that science are predicated upon 
in order for science itself to operate. One of those is this idea of, you know, uh, specific events can be generalized to uh, general conclusions. For example, I might boil a thousand water at one atmosphere and find that 1,000 beakers of water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. I'm now going to say all water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at room, at room conditions at one atmosphere. Yeah. So I'm going to say that. That's my generalization. That generalization is built upon an inductive process. The assumption here would be that specific events can be generalized to cover all realities. That's an assumption. The second assumption would be is, is that the thing that's causing the fire, the boiling, is the heat. So what's causing the effect is the heat because there's nothing in, – in logic, you've got three things. You've got logically necessary things, you've got logically possible things, and you've got logically impossible things. Things that we experience, like, for example, what temperature water boils at, is not something you can work out by the definition of water. So it's not a logically necessary thing. It's rather something you have to experience, hence it's a logical possible thing. If it's logically possible – then it means it's not deterministic that it will always have to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. There, There's yeah. nothing in the nature of water that tells us this. Yeah, It's just because the universe operates according to a system we assume will hold and fix throughout the whole of the universe. And that's the assumptions that we build upon these arguments. But that's why I'm saying that when it comes to experience, we have a certain philosophical axiomatic views about how the world operates that allows us to then understand well, the example interpret the history, experience. Yeah. Auxiliary, what do they call them? Auxiliary assumptions? Uh, I'm not sure if it's called auxiliary assumptions, but they're axiomatic in the scientific method. Well, for example, like a um, long time ago, uh, when the planet Uranus was discovered, you know, astronomers yeah. attempted to predict its orbit. Yeah. And then based on those predictions on Newton's laws and those auxiliary assumptions about the mass of the sun and masses, orbits, and velocities of other planets, yeah. one of those assumptions was that no other planetary bodies existed in the vicinity of Uranus. So when they made their observations back then, they found that the orbit they had predicted for the planet was incorrect. And so they didn't know what to do with that. So there was some sort of error in their auxiliary assumptions that they didn't account for. Yeah, there were certain variables. But, you know, logic ended up, um, you know, working for them, right? Mm. So, so I'll give you another example similar to the one that you've given, which maybe hopefully explains it a bit better, is, you know, stars in galaxies orbit around a central mass, a supermassive black, black hole. Right. Now, the stars at the inner part of the galaxy they orbit at a similar speed to the stars at the outer edges of the galaxies is what they found. Now, uh, according to the th theory of gravity, that's impossible because the stars that are on the out outer edge of the galaxy should orbit slower because if they don't orbit slower, if they're orbiting at the same speed, they will break their orbit and leave uh, the gravitational pull of uh, uh, the supermassive black hole further out. Yeah. yeah. So what they said is they said they had two options. One, either we change our theory of gravity. Yeah. And they said, no, that holds true universally. That was, again, an assumption, but because it, it was very well verified through experience. So they wanted to keep that. So the second thing that they said, there must be a cause that is causing gravity to allow for the theory of gravity, as we know it, the law of gravity, as we know it to remain true yeah and so therefore they came up with this idea of dark matter right uh, and, and neutrinos as an explanation to say that there's some gravity that's exerting the force throughout the universe dark matter right that allows these orbits to all or, uh, the stars to orbit at the same speed on the outer edges of the galaxy compared to the ones on the inner edge right the inner assumption because they haven't really observed directly dark matter, but they just see this anomaly. And so they account for it by this invisible matter or something yeah. like matter. 
But, you know, they do have some sort of predictions about neutrinos. And I think um, not long ago they detected um, some particles that that um, that were predicted if neutrinos were true or maybe the neutrinos themselves. I forgot. But but, yeah, I mean, the, the best way to to at least I wouldn't say prove things, but at least to justify and kind of build on our knowledge is testable predictions. That's how. Yeah, yeah. Works. There's fine testable. We can do testable predictions. But the only you know the reason why testable predictions is important is because it it removes any hidden variables. That's all it does. It right. doesn't change the data per se. For example, um, so in that example of the the stars orbiting, what they did was they they already had the assumption of causality. That's the point. There's an effect here, which is a rotation of stars around uh, the central mass, and it was going at a particular speed. So that's the effect. And they're thinking, well, that effect cannot be explained by our current knowledge of the galaxy. So there must be another cause. And that's why they inserted the idea of dark, uh, dark matter. Right. So, so, that's, so that's why I'm saying that that's a presupposition. That's a, that's a first philosophy that we have to have in order to operate our observations within yeah, the universe. Yeah, and, and I agree that we all we all um, act on certain presuppositions. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, even um, our current understanding of how the universe works, it would work in the framework of materialism. It works in the framework of idealism. It would work in the framework of uh, dualism or theism. It'll work. You can make it work. And everything will still add up the same way, maybe post hoc in a way, but you can kind of backward engineer and say, look, we don't know the mechanics of the dream, if you will, if you're an idealist. And this is how it works within this cosmic mind. And so idealism can be a justified assumption or a presupposition about the world. And there's a there's some scientists that do that, actually, philosophers and scientists that think that the universe is a um, kind of like a cosmic mind, maybe panpsychism or idealism. Yeah. Um, but then there's some that say it's materialist. Materialism is the metaphysical primary thing. I think every one of them, the universe may work as we observe it, but it also has a lot of problems with all <clears> of <throat> these. And I so, think that's why it's kind yeah. of an open question. So I'm kind of agnostic on ontological claims like that. So, so what we would say is, I, or I would say, is the problem with materialism is that if we now assume causality as being the operating law within the universe, and therefore that every contingent being, yeah, possible being, requires an explanation as to why it exists in the way it does, then you're going to get into a situation of having a potential infinite regress of explanations. Yeah, and that infinite regress would therefore be a logical impossibility. So you need a foundational what's explanation the that explains That's the rest right. of the universe. Well, so now, what, what, what's the argument for those claims? And, and there's like two main claims so, that you made that I want you to support. Uh, one is that materialism leads to, you know, basically determinism, everything having a cause. And two, that an infinite regress is impossible. A, a past events is impossible. Uh, good luck. Sorry, I didn't catch that because uh, my uh, the voice went a bit. Funny okay. On my phone. Okay. So, so you said an infinite regress is impossible, and that, and that materialism leads to an infinite regress of causality. If we assume causality is a uh, necessary principle that comes prior to observation, then yeah, you're going to fall into an infinite regress. Yeah, and you said, and you said the problem with that is that. You know, it leads to a logical impossibility. What's the argument? Yeah, an, inf an infinite regress would be a logical impossibility, yeah. Yeah, but you're repeating the claim. Why do you believe that claim, sir? A uh, number of arguments. One of the arguments is that you can't have an infinite sum of finite things. It results in logical absurdities. That's, that's begging the question. You're saying the same thing with different words. What's the argument? Oh, the ar well, I'll give you a number of different arguments. One argument is that in order for us to get to this moment in time, so therefore it's this causal chain that exists in a chronological order, required, us, required an infinite series in order to get to this moment, then you need to traverse an endless series or you'd have to have an endless series to end to get to this moment. Yeah, where, where's the contradiction? You, you said it's an impossibility, right? Like you said end, it's a logical yeah. impossibility, right? So where's so the contradiction? The word endless series would have to end 
an endless series um, cannot end. Um, how, how so? Like, if I say there's an infinite regress of past events, I'm admitting that it's endless, right? Yeah, but to get to this moment in time, this conversation, if you had an infinite series of events that traverse the past, you'd have to traverse that endless series of events to get to this moment. Yeah, yeah of you, course. So that's that's entailed by, by the idea, but I'm asking so, for you to point out the contradiction. No, but do you not see that point? An endless series has to end to get to this moment. Uh, no, uh, no, why, well, why would end, you cause that? <laughs> no, do you not understand the point? A an endless, if it's endless, it doesn't end, does it? Yeah, yeah, it goes uh, from now until, you know, forever in the past, right? Yeah, but an endless series would have to have ended to get to this moment in time. I don't, I don't know why, why you would say that. Well, the endless series, series cannot end, end to get, end. therefore we'd never get to this oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. You're saying that it's like endless in both directions? Like, you know. No, no. To I this moment, so. from this moment to the past is, a, is an infinite series. So yeah, to yeah, get yeah. from the past to this moment, you have to traverse an endless series to end that series to get to this moment. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, th thank you for clarifying. The no, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. If you, if you ever heard of the Thompson's lamp paradox, it's similar to what to what he's explaining. Yeah, but uh, okay, we can say that uh, you know, from the eternal past till now, it's an endless series. But I, I don't I don't know why he would say that the series would have to end. Because to get to this moment, you'd have to you have to have. Let's say you've got. You, you would have moment. to traverse an infinite past, right? It's endless. Yeah, yeah. You, but oh, exactly, you can't. To get to this, mo so we're at the very end of time, let's say, yeah, or the very moment. This moment was built upon a series of causes. Those causes were infinite. Like, for example, let's say you had an infinite number of dominoes. For the last domino to fall over, it has to be hit by the domino before it. And then that has to be hit by the domino before that. And that has to be hit by the domino before that. If there's no beginning domino, would any of the dominoes fall over? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure, but but what's a contradiction? You haven't pointed it. So none of the dominoes would fall over, would they? <laughs> would they, none of the dominoes? Look, you, you said you said that an infinite regress is impossible. I'm asking you to justify that, but if you don't have an argument, you can say so and retract the claim. That's his justification that you did, like because there's no beginning. But, there's no beginning. No following now, you never get to now. Yeah. But look, what you said basically has been like, oh, okay, if there's like an infinite regress of past events, that then it would take like literally forever to get from the eternal past to now. And, and yes, it would be it would be an in, <laughs> an infinite series. Well, of course. <laughs> but that, so what? That, that infinite series would have to end, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's what you're trying to argue for. But no, no, it would have to end to get to this moment. By definition, okay. Yeah. Uh, so an yeah, endless yeah. series, something that does not end, has to end. Yeah, it, it doesn't end because it goes back until forever ago. But this moment, I'm talking about this very moment, you know, uh, yeah. what is it, 27th of... of uh, the best well, way I I'm, I'm, I'm in 27th at the moment. Oh, you, you guys if, are probably still in 26th. 26th you, of December. Yeah, it's a 26th for um, about another hour <laughs> for me. Um, but as if, as if you set up a, a, a set of dominoes and right now the all the other dominoes are knocked down except this very moment right now it's still standing but that last domino is going to knock this current moment down into the next moment and then as as the moments go by that's that last domino that's still standing and if you go back three thousand or if you go back to any domino in the series, you would still have an infinite amount of causes and effects that preceded and is in front of that domino. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a question about this? Because this is something I like to know because I've heard this argument a lot of times, and this is one of the biggest sticking points by scientists and a lot of, a lot of people asking. Now, you're assuming if the universe exists that something outside this universe caused this one to exist, correct? Yeah. Okay, so how do you know that the laws outside the universe are the same one in this universe, how can you make any justification about them? Because you can, I, I agree you can make that argument within our universe because of the laws within this universe. I don't know how you can go outside this universe 
and say that this is going to happen outside because you have no idea what is outside this universe. The laws could be different. It could be a, a it could be in a state where there would be no logical contradiction about an infinite regress. How would you know what's outside this universe? Then it's magic then, isn't it? Then you might as well right? appeal to magic. No, I'm not appealing to magic. I'm asking you how do you know? No, but that's what I'm saying. I'm saying if we believe in materialism, this is what I said. I said at the beginning, if we believe in materialism and we I'm believe not that... Magic. I, I'm just saying something outside this universe could act in a, in a different law, in a different... So, sort of yeah, it's, I'm just what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying that if we say that outside the universe causality does not exist and material not things do that. not material things do not cause us the material things yeah then we would have to assume, then we would basically say that this universe came out of nothing if you say well could there no, be I'm outside this I'm then you, the, the other I'm, argument which you're saying is that well, I'm, not a, be, I'm not saying anything you're saying that yeah. i'm just saying i don't know what's outside this universe i have no idea how the laws operate outside this universe i don't even know if time would exist outside this universe there's different models which scientists are proposing and i'm not a scientist i'm just saying that we don't know anything outside this universe. And I'm not making any claims about anything. I'm saying, how are you making one when you don't know the laws outside this universe? So I, this is why I said at the beginning, because I said that causality is a principle we assume prior to experience. So it's but not what I'm not, I'm not this building. This is within this universe. We know no, this. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm saying this is a, this is what we call a, a metaphysical uh ontology it's a it's a reality that exists independent of space time so it's not it's not conditioned by what particular locality you are in the universe causality is a principle that's independent of space time because it's a it's an axiom by which we use to experience reality so it's not something that i sense reality like the water boiling it's valid to say, well, how do I know the water would boil 100 degrees Celsius on the top of Mount Everest? Well, I don't know, yeah, because I have to experience it. It's a, po it's a logical possibility for it to boil at any uh, temperature. But here what we're saying is that this is a necessary principle that comes prior to experience. And so if this necessary principle is logical, then it holds true independent of space-time. So it's not dependent upon which oh, universe you're in. Now I understand why you're not accepting my argument of experience. <laughs> but but do, do, do we do we all accept causality though, or, or, or do we have to argue on that one? Too? Oh no, you don't. You don't have to accept causality. We can accept magic. No, I mean no, no. I accept causality. But is, there, is, there, is there anyone here? Is there any? Is there anyone here who does not accept causality? I presuppose causality. Yeah, I pre yeah. That's that, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, it doesn't matter how how you, or your reasons or lack of for accepting it. You know, it's the question is, do you accept it or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So four contingent beings. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so causality, shape, and uh, you're trying to argue for something causing the universe from the outside, right? I'm yeah. saying there has to be a primary necessary being to cause, cause the reality of contingent beings. I'm no, not okay. See, I'm not saying there's not there, there's nothing outside this universe yeah. that has to cause it. I'm just saying I can't I can't see how anybody can come to any any explanation of how this came about when you have no idea what's outside the universe or how it operates. Yeah, but th this is the point: is that either we're saying that the universe came about by no causes, one, yeah, two, yeah, we're saying it's, we're like, it's like if you use the, the model of I, a, a simplistic model of a Sean Kerr, right? Where the only thing you have outside the universe is radiation Sometimes. and, and, and uh, oh, fuck, what is it there? I forgot the name. Like, in a way, he says, where time would not exist. Yeah. Okay? Now, he says, he says if certain things could happen mm -hmm. with a reaction that would cause this universe to come about. Like, there would be no time where, and then, and then other models where you can't scale time and there's no metric of time. Yeah, quantum fluctuation. Yeah. I'm asking if, if this argument is so simplistic and what you're saying, how come all the scientists not buying into this? I, I'm, I'm not getting it. Well, there are some scientists that buy into this, so it's not like there are no scientists that buy into this. Yeah, but yeah I like a few of them. You have to understand like, also is that this is not a scientific discussion. Remember, that's well, why... I know it's not a scientific discussion, but if, you look, if, you, if you're using the laws of cause and effect in, in infinite regress, well, that's, that can be scientific. No, because science can't prove it. Science proves what's quantifiable, isn't it? Qu science looks at the quantifiability of things. Yo, yo uh, and, before and we debate can, on whether or not this is a scientific discussion, can we have like Shafe like lay, lay down the argument? 
and see how it is, how, how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'm on one percent battery, so I'm gonna have to go in a bit. So it might, oh, it might cut out. Um, but which, what argument do you want me to give? Well, well I mean, you were saying something along the lines that, uh, okay, so there's causality and, and something to do with materialism, like, no, like you're trying to argue. Okay, saying go under, ahead. Under a materialistic uh, outlook and under the uh, the axiom of causality then you'd have to come to a conclusion that either an infinite regress exists or that there's a necessary foundation to explain contingent realities. Yeah, and I'm saying that an infinite regress cannot exist because of Thompson's lamp paradox is one example, uh, David Hilbert's hotel and the paradox of an infinite set is another problem. And also the fact that an endless series would have to end, but the fact that it's an endless series would it, it would not end because it would have to end to get to this moment in time. All of these things would therefore discount the possibility of an infinite regress. So therefore, we we come to the conclusion of a necessary foundation for reality or a necessary being. And now that's based on definition. But... It, what's what's the definition I've used there? Sorry. No, no. So what I'm saying is that you're saying that if these things are endless, by definition, they could not have a beginning, yeah. which means that this is outside of the realm of scientific inquiry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's not. It's, it, and science only looks at what's quantifiable, and we can only quantify the finite. Yeah. And when we look at the example of uh, Sean Carroll or anybody like that, like I said, they're looking at things from the methodological approach of science which is quantifiability but even if they try to argue and say well time you know photons don't experience time therefore if the all, all that exists prior to this universe was photons therefore there was no time then what we would then say is okay so if photons or if there was this timeless uh you know uh reality prior to the universe we would say, well, firstly, what is time? We would say time is the measurement of change. So what does changes matter? So therefore, we have to ask the question, what causes a timeless state, which remains eternal, to change, to become temporal? We're still looking at causation. We're still I looking know. for an explanation. Is that even coherent, though? What's that? Which, which bit's not coherent? <laughs> yeah. well, well, I mean, t talking about a timeless change, a timeless state changing into anything. So exactly, yeah, that's my point. If it's timeless, yeah, and it's prior to the universe and we live in a temporal state, then the timeless state would remain timeless. It would remain, it would remain unchanged. Be static. And yes. it wouldn't make sense that something would begin to exist because that's a temporal statement. Which is where we live in. We live in temporality. So the point being is that even this timeless state, something have had to have initiated a change to it. That's why we thought it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's so uh, external that's, to that's why we have these kind of arguments every day. <laughs> yeah. Nobody knows what the fuck we're talking about. <laughs> but, but, but that's supposed to be an argument against materialism, or am I misrepresenting you, Shaif or Shaif? How do you pronounce it? Sharif. Sharif. Yeah, Sharif. Like the sheriff. Um, yeah, so it's an argument against that materialism is a fundamental explanation to all that exists. We can't just adhere to that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And you said that, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll grant you the conclusion of the argument you laid out, that it's either uh, an infinite regress of uh, explanations or or a regress that terminates in a necessary thing. Yeah. But, but oh, okay. But, but yeah, how does that... Um, Maybe how does that do away way. with materialism to put it that way so the necessary thing so when when i define materialism i define it as contingent things contingent beings beings basically means things that exist oh uh, well well i mean that that's on you right the materialists would say that you know they're they're physical they're material but you know they, like, they can be necessary or not. yeah so the, the contingent what we mean by contingent we mean that they could have been another way they they're yeah they're, no, i understand like, yeah, the explanation of why they have the attributes or the form that they have is not self-explained. So therefore, they need an explanation outside of itself. Yeah, okay. Okay, but um, yeah, you could have like a, a regress that terminates in a necessary thing that could not have not existed and that thing be material. Well, so, sorry. I, I, yeah, so yeah, so it has to be something which is necessary. I, a thing which 
uh, could only have been that way, had to exist. What about yeah, a plate? Right you know, and I'm asking you how that rules out materialism, but because that that thing that had to exist had to determine the existence of uh, of contingent temporal reality. If that necessary being is eternal, and the effect is temporal, then it means that the necessary being did was not forced. You, you said you said that it had to determine something. What do you mean by that? Like so like is that like a mental process or? Yeah, yeah, mental process. Yeah, so it has to be a mind oh, okay. of some sort. Oh, because oh, really oh, okay. So, so you're saying there's there has to be a necessary thing that that's at the start of the regress, and it's a mind as well. Okay, you, you're piling on claims it. upon claims. It, yeah. Do you want to do you want to go try to justify that? Yeah. So, if this necessary being was eternal, if we agree upon that, do we agree upon that, or are we just agreeing upon for the sake of the argument? Yeah, okay, okay, fine. Let's go for the sake of the argument. Okay, an an okay. eternal, necessary thing. Go ahead. And the effect is temporal. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. if if the cause, if everything's sufficient for the cause, so the effect, uh, so everything's sufficient for the cause to cause its effect exist, and the cause is eternal, what would the effect be? Uh, so, say it one more time. So if everything necessary for the cause to exist causes the effect and the cause is eternal, what would be the effect? Would it be temporal or would it be eternal? Uh, oh, you're, you're going to say it's eternal, but... No, I say it's temporal. The effect is temporal. Mm -hmm. The universe began to exist 13.78 billion years ago. Right. So, therefore... The cause is not some, this eternal cause or this necessary being is not some mechanical force that necessarily had to create out of compulsion of its nature, but rather chose. The best explanation here would be will, yeah, intentionality. So, so something about this timeless thing changed and made it decide to, you know, create all contingencies? No, no, no. The timeless thing I was explaining from what Ron was explaining about Sean Carroll's position. Sean Carroll was explaining that prior to this universe, there could have been a timeless state. Yeah, prior Arif, to this universe. Arif, is it possible that all possible um, actualization happens? Like that maybe some maybe the maybe the cosmos didn't determine or or actually did determine that all possibilities actuate. Is it possible that it wasn't a decision, but that every possibility actually... No, the reason why I'd say that, that's like uh, an argument that would be an argument for multiverses or an infinite number of universes in the cosmos. And the reason right. why I say that can't be the case is two, two arguments, but one of the main arguments is the argument that an infinite sum of finite things is a logical impossibility yeah. and the logical impossibility would i give any i give the example of an infinite number of marbles if you had an infinite pile of marbles and you cut the pile of marbles in half how many marbles you have in each half exactly infinite every mm -hmm. yeah but uh, but you, i mean that doesn't that kind of assume that all infinites are the same right or should be treated the same all countable infinites are the same yeah just everything is an assumption what happens within our world, which I don't think you can make. Well, you, you're the one that's making the assumptions about throwing stones in water. Yeah, and so are mine. Mine are all valid assumptions as well. Yeah, but wait, you, know, wait, you, wait, you have to you, look. How, I asked you a while ago how in the possible world would you know what's outside this universe and the best explanation that i ever heard from a scientist and they almost 100 percent agree on this is the best that we can do is say the law breaks down at the origins of the universe the laws of the physics laws of nature break out nobody can make a claim what's outside the universe we have no idea what's out there so that's the best explanation i've ever heard from any scientist that works well, in cosmology there's many, but, many uh, but there's then many people that don't have any experience in cosmology or not quantum mechanics seem to come up with an answer, which I find pretty weird. Sorry. No, no. It's, this is not, like I said, this is not a fundamentally a scientific discussion. Science is only going to be able to tell us what we experience, what is quantifiable. So, yeah, there might be variables that we don't know about. 
But those variables are different to talking about logically necessary things. Yeah. So, and that's the first thing. And the second thing that I would say is on what basis do we have the right to deny causality outside of this universe? On what basis, apart from special pleading, but to say what causality doesn't exist outside the universe? I'm, I'm not saying nobody denies universe. it. I'm just saying they're not making any any assumption or any guesses what's outside. No, but, I'm not saying they're I, denying it. They're just saying we but, don't know. So we're, but, we don't have we don't have an answer. But every experience that we have follows a causal pattern. So on what basis do we have the right to say that a future observation, whether in the universe or outside the universe, suddenly no longer has to follow causality? Okay, no. I'm not saying well, we no. no, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, he's using inductive reasoning there. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it, or then it would be a special pleading case to say, well, causality at this moment just doesn't exist. Well, why? Oh, we just but they're not saying that. <laughs> see, see, Shay, here's the thing, right? I, I understand, right, that, um, you know, your argument is uh, a priori. It's philosophical. It's not scientific. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I don't hold it to scientism. But, you know, I, I take it that bow is more, it has more of like a mindset of scientism, or, or am I wrong? And that's probably the disconnect between you two. Yeah, so yeah. Every time he's making a philosophical argument, but he's, he's 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 using logic and reason, and I'm saying that how can you like in this uh, in this world in our planet right now, we're using logic, ration, and reason to to figure out an unknown, but we we rationalize the known to get to an unknown, right? But what we're doing here is that we're going outside this universe and we're trying to rationalize an unknown to get to a known, which I don't think you can do. How can you how can you be logically make an argument about something you have no idea how, how it operates uh, well, well i mean he's going from the known to you know i, I guess the unknown he, you know he's making an inference of causality from this world and saying yeah, that well yeah. i just don't says the laws breaks down at the origins of the universe if they break down what does that state like if 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 you're going to use the, the, the examples of the, of our universe then you have to say that you're not using really a philo philosophical argument. No, right? I'm saying there's two arguments, Ron. The first argument is to explain that logic pre is, is an axiom for experience. So we have to assume logic in order to make intelligible uh, concepts about the, about the world around us. And that means, therefore, that logic is independent of space and time, which means it is no longer contingent to a particular universe. It's not conditioned by the locality that you're in, yeah? It's I understand, I understand. I understand. That's the first argument. The second argument is the argument of induction, yeah, which is to say that, look, that's what we've all experienced. So we will, we will therefore posit other parts of the universe following the same principles of causality. We don't posit that it doesn't. For example, as an example of this, yeah, we say the universe is flat, yeah? Space-time is flat. So space-time could be a curve, it could be concaved, or it could be flat. One of the ways that they assume that, or establish that, is they look at the microwave background radiation, and they take three points, and those three points form a triangle, and they look at the internal angles of the triangle. If the internal angles of the triangle add up to 180 degrees, it means space-time is flat, because uh, the internal angles of a triangle on a sphere adds more than 180 degrees, and on a concave surface, it's less than 180 degrees. So they're using metaphysical principles such as the internal angles of a triangle with the observations to look at the logical entailment to say, therefore, the universe is flat. And that's all I'm doing as well. You but, could say another part of the universe isn't flat, but that's not what they say. <laughs> well, maybe what Ron's talking about is kind of like a good example would be uh, quantum logic versus... Um, classical logic right yeah like in the classical world you know we use what um a modular lat a modular lattice you know quantum logic uses a weakly modular lattice in it but they come to totally different mathematical representations right yeah quantum logic is very complex and it doesn't work at all according to the intuition of classical logic so, so is it possible then that outside of our universe, there's something similar to quantum logic going on, something that's not intuitive to the way that we 
understand things. Maybe that's what Ron is referring well, to. I'm just saying, it, you know, a little bit, Scott, but I'm just saying is that we have no idea how anything operates outside this universe. And all we can do is, you know, we can sit here and make, make logical and rational and reasonable assumptions by what's happening in this world. That's fine. But yeah. I don't know that I would change my my worldview of of what ifs, right? Because it's we have no idea. We have yeah. no idea that what's outside. That's why I say an argument for God on contingency in, in the Kalam is basically saying that you're trying to assume that the, the way our universe operates, it operates outside this universe. And I don't know that you can make that assumption. So, so the first thing is, I agree with you that it is logical, reasonable, and rational to come to that conclusion of a necessary being. That that's fine, and you can say, but there could be a hidden variable that we just don't know about. And I'm saying, well, that hidden variable, if it is a uh, an observation, it's something that's now going to be within the purview of causality because that's how we approach and think about the world. Is when you say being a necessary being, are you speaking of a mind? Yeah, yeah, a necessary uh, a being by God. Uh, okay, that, okay, okay, that, okay, great, great. Then that argument is based upon the fact that if you've got an eternal cause, you would have an eternal effect. But we don't see an eternal effect. We see an eternal cause if we conclude that there's a necessary being because of the impossibility of an infinite regress. Then you have an eternal cause, but you have a temporal effect. The only explanation or the best explanation to explain why you would have a uh, temporal effect from an eternal cause is will. There was intentionality. But do, do, do you see the problem with that, though? Like, well, I mean, there's several problems, but the main the main Give problem. Give me one of them. Give me the main problem. Well, well, I mean, you're, you're trying to say the, the, the conclusion you're trying to argue, you're trying to say that it's a necessary truth, but then you appeal to an inference of the best explanation, which will not give you a necessary truth. Yes. No, but it's fine. I, I don't think there's a problem in just simply saying what's the best explanation. Yeah, I'm yeah but, but then but then but then you're not talking about a necessary truth. You're talking about the most probable truth. But even even let's say I want to be uh what's the word? Uh I want to be um moderate. See man, a, a necessary say, truth is a truth that is and it's impossible for it to it, not it, be it, another way, right? So it, it has like a hundred percent probability yeah. of being true. It so has to be have, true, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, so Sharif, have, I'll, Sharif, I'll agree with you that you have a great explanation Thank you. of the origins of our universe that makes sense. And I'll agree with that, but I don't base my beliefs on a great explanation. I believe I base my belief of what I can I can I can reason out and rationalize. And I can't I rationalize that. But you got a great explanation. Don't get me wrong. It's a good <laughs> So I'm saying this. So there's a few ways to look at this. Uh, I can't remember who uh, asked that. Rogue. Was it Rogue? I think it was, that? yeah. Yeah, so Rogue. Yeah, so... There's a few ways to look at this. Firstly, is that, you know, if I want to make a moderate claim about the nature of God and say that it's reasonable to ex uh, to accept this proposition, that it's a reasonable belief, then I can say, yeah, it's reasonable to accept that. Accept that. The second thing is, is that there is a logical problem in saying that an eternal cause exists and that there's a temporal effect. Because if this eternal cause is uh, the only necessary being and it's independent, yeah, our say, as we would say, uh, if it has aseity, then there's no external reasons to cause it to create. So therefore, the reasons have to be internal to itself, and that internal yeah, spontaneous, itself, not spontaneous, because it, again, like I said, if you got everything sufficient for the cause to cause the effect, then the effect would necessarily. If you got, if why, but, but what, what caused it to make that decision at at that point rather than earlier? That we that's that I can't answer that question. That's something that goes beyond my uh metaphysical commitment. Yeah, so, 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 so you have you have this eternal God. God God at this point decided to create. Yeah. You know, not before, not not after. Yeah. And it's eternal. Yeah. So you you know, what explains that change? Or are you saying it's know. spontaneous? No, no, I'm not saying spontaneous, I'm saying spontaneous. But but at the same time, the the natural the materialist could also posit something similar, right? How would they like, infinite infinitely descending chains are possible according to uh, set theories, right? Infinite set theories don't talk about uh, causal chains. 
Infinite set theories talk about countable and uncountable infinite sets. Can I ask yeah. a question? In Ro infinite Ro defending uh, chains, they do. What's hey, that, sorry? Uh, who, are, Ro, who are you there? I never met you before. Are you a friend of Justin's? Uh, anybody in this room? Wait, are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm, I'm just... Just introduce yourself. Are you friends with Justin? Or anybody you know? Anybody in this group? Uh, uh, uh I I know Mr. Batman. Oh, you know Hello, Mr. Mr. Heathen. I, I saw the link on a server. I've Are talked you? to Kylo before. <laughs> Do you know anybody else? Do you know anybody else in this group, bro? Uh, Batman and Kylo, and I think that's it. Uh, unless you use different names on Discord. Uh, my, my name is well, I just recently switched my name on here because I'm not. No, I'm only Kylo on Discord. I explained this to these guys before. But, Kylo uh, Craig. Yeah, Kylo Craig. Let me go ahead and turn my camera off. There you go. There's well, welcome, Kylo. Welcome to the discussion, Rogue, and welcome to Mr. Batman. Yeah, yeah Rogue. We, we have we have discussions on uh, you know uh, just in Facebook Messenger. Come on, there we can have uh, more of a chat. But yeah. Just, just going back onto this point. The issue is this, is that if you've got, if X causes Y, and if X exists, therefore Y exists. If X is eternal, then Y would also be eternal. If X exists and Y does not exist, but exists at some times, and there's no other external factors to X, then the only explanation would be contained within X. And that explanation would be will. Now, you say, well, what about where was the change? Why did it change from willing to not willing? One argument would be used, which was an argument from a Muslim scholar from a thousand years ago called Imam Ghazali. He said that the necessary being eternally willed at that moment to create. Yeah, so that was his explanation. But I think uh, the other other explanation, which goes hmm. back to what I think Craig was, uh, Scott, sorry, was asking before, which is that when you've got a number of possibilities, so the so water could boil at 100 degrees, 90 degrees, 110, 120, whatever number, Everything within the universe is contingent. It required a determinant in order to determine why it has that possibility as to, as to any other possibility. Yeah, Why does Planck's constant have that particular value as opposed to any uh, other? Can I, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Uh, like, you would agree that there's like two options, right? Either God's choice at that time uh, was determined or not, right? Uh, was determined or not, yeah. Yeah, and Al Ghazali's option would be that it, it was determined. You, you no, know, Ghazali's option is say that it wasn't determined. It was the fact that God chose. He has pure free will. Okay, okay, okay. But the one where you know it was set to happen at, at that moment from yeah. So he you chose. Know, before. So God chose to create at that moment. Yeah. So it's like. Okay, those are your two choices, and and like the materialists would also have those same two choices, but but you also said that, oh, that, that um, it, it ha like this oh. has to be explained by will, it, um, you know what happened at this time as opposed to another time, um, and, yeah, and I'm I'm interested in reasons for that. Yeah, so the reason is because if it's a materialistic cause which had no will, then the materialistic cause has to cause. It cannot not cause. Yeah, but like, but it could be spontaneous, like like in quantum mechanics, right? Where yeah, you have then, uh, uncaused but, events. But then, then it's a possible being now. And now it's something that could have occurred, could not have occurred. And therefore, it would need an explanation as to why it was spontaneous, unless we appeal to magic. Well, I mean, that's the same problem that theists have, though. How is it really yeah, like, um, This theist doesn't have that problem. No, we have the, we have the solution. People yeah. make decisions either because of reasons or randomly. How does uh, how do you get out of that dichotomy? So we so the, this is the problem. Problem is that this is where I'd agree with Ron on this point, which is that there's only so far that our metaphysics can take us. So we can't explain what the reason was for God and what did God rationalize. We wouldn't make that. Um, I can. Uh, that's a physical but commitment on that. Did those reasons determine his action? Uh, yep. So I, the question is, what do we mean by how, a reasoning process in, in the nature well, of this? reason, like um, his nature, did his nature determine his... Not, uh, not his nature, uh, his ability to choose. Right? And his ability to choose is part of his nature. 
Cool, I better okay, go, God, guys, because it's 4 40 a.m. and right. I should really sleep. <laughs> Can God <laughs> really guys. Nice talking to you. you I thank, I thank you for coming on, Sharif. Uh, we're going to be setting up a date for Sharif to uh, be debating against one of our uh, uh, ex Muslim friends, uh, Josh Boyd, the, ar uh, the archaeologist. Uh, we'll be setting that up for mid January, so get ready for that. Uh, and, uh, and just.